What's going on guys? Give me a second to let my laptop catch up. It's Illuminostic and uh, both the missus and I have been suffering from a uh, stomach bug. And so I'm not going to be on long, but I saw something last night that was just so inspiring and, and it feels so important that uh, even though I felt compelled to push my live streams that require a lot of presence of mind um, till tomorrow, the secret stream for patrons um, is going to be on the number nine as explained by Albert Pike in his Morals and Dogma uh, book. Um, and before that, we're going to talk about this new flow state lifestyle program that I have designed and dopamine baseline elevation. And I'm really excited about this stuff. I feel like it's an opportunity for me to make an original contribution that is actually very valuable uh, to the psychedelic medicine scene. And even this stuff is useful for people that don't use this medicine. So I'm really excited to do that, but I need a certain level of of presence of mind to be able to deliver it well. I want to thank a couple of new patrons, uh, Misty there in the chat and um, the Inner Lighthouse. Thank you guys so much for your support. We are demonetized on this channel, so uh, if you don't support us, we don't get any compensation for anything that we do. Okay, so I, I saw uh, the first two episodes of um, Michael Pollan's new Netflix documentary, um, How to Change Your Mind on Netflix over the last couple of nights. And the first episode just reminded me how much I have spent my life immersed in the history. And, uh, you know, I, I just, I knew every single detail of, you know, Leary and Albert Hoffman and all of this history they went through. Um, but I think, you know, it's really important for people to actually know the story um, because, you know, if you, if you have the opinion or if you're even open to the opinion, that there is a sort of intelligence, not not God, we're not talking about God here, but a, a universal consciousness or, you know, even you could think of it as just the collective subconscious of the human race uh, that is sort of creating these circumstances in very improbable ways. Um, in fact, along those lines, a book that I would recommend uh, is High Priest by Dr. Timothy Leary. Um, so they go through the whole history of how the, the psychedelic movement started, um, and it, it, that's all very, very interesting, uh, and as I said, I think it's important, um, but you know, it was kind of all like I could recite all of it by heart, <laughs> um, but there is a lesser known figure from that time period, um, started writing books during the, that time period, um, a little bit later than Leary and Huxley and all of these guys, um, and his name is Rick Doblin. And he pioneered um, basically the concept of MDMA therapy. He was uh, friends, what's going on Shane? He was friends with the Shulgins. Um, and at, at 18 years old, he, I, he took MDMA, which actually has been around since 1911, uh, which was a little factoid that had somehow escaped me and kind of surprised me that this stuff has been kind of out there for, you know, 110 years. Um, and, you know, I've been aware of Rick Doblin since I was like 12 or 13 years old when I started researching psychedelics. Uh, he's kind of a lesser known figure, um, but the work that he's done is extremely important. And I didn't realize uh, that he actually had started his battle um, to try to legitimize psychedelic therapy and psychedelic medicine uh, when he was 18 years old and he's now 68. So he is just really starting to see uh, some fruit, you know, from his labors. Uh, he, he said at the end of the, um, the segment of the series that is dedicated mostly to him, uh, that he, all he ever wanted was to be a psychedelic therapist. And now finally, after 50 years of battling, he is able to do that. And another um, asp, and that, that, really, that really moved me, by the way, I mean, for those of you that are younger or maybe haven't been as deeply invested in the psychedelic scene, I guess, as I have, um, you know, and also my alienation as a child, having a really uh, severely mentally ill mother and, uh, you know, just generally abusive single mother kind of situation. I mean, my father was not my father in any, anyways, but he was kind of in and out, um, you know, and and really is coming from this sort of consciousness that was not, I was alone, you know, 
uh, the discovery of books by people like Dr. Timothy Leary and the realization that the kind of consciousness that I had, um, well, I wasn't the only person in the world that thought like this, you know? Um, and what seems so out there and, and in, in, insane to general, the general public, I guess, it seems just so natural and obvious to me. Um, before I had ever taken LSD or any psychedelic, I had started to read Leary and uh, I think probably McKenna. Um, and, you know, so it just gave me this sense of, of not being alone in, in the world. These were like these alien um, outcasts like myself uh, that uh, it just, it gave me a, a lot of comfort to know that they were there, that they had been there. And, um, and I think I also intuitively knew, no, I know that I intuitively knew um, that these plants and, and even the chemical compounds were extremely important for people like myself that had been subjected to early childhood trauma and violence. Uh, you know, there were murders all around my neighborhood. Um, when I was a kid, I saw my babysitter when I was nine walking down the street shooting at guys that were beating her brother with a lead pipe. Uh, you know, 18 year old kid stabbed 63 times or something by another guy that was high on PCP in the neighbor's yard one night. This kind of stuff was um, really normal in my neighborhood. And then, you know, my mother was uh, just layers of, of insane, um, all sorts of different diagnoses I'm sure she would have gotten. Uh, had she sought help, which unfortunately she never did and ended up commu committing suicide. So, I, you know, I think it was the first or second time that I ever took LSD. I, I was, I think, like 15 years old, 14 maybe. And, and I actually said to my friend, I, I think you could probably treat alcoholism and, and depression and, and every psychological problem that we are aware of with these compounds. Like, it was immediately obvious to me. And so... You know, I have been acutely aware of the tragedy, uh, the unfairness, the brutality um, of the prohibition of psychedelic medicine, uh, even even beyond uh, recreation. You know, of course, I'm a firm believer in the fact that, you know, we should have free will. The Constitution of the United States actually pr protects our right to use whatever drugs we deem necessary in whatever context we uh, determine for ourselves. Um, in fact, that's why they had to do the Marijuana Tax Act instead of outright outlawing drugs, uh, because it was unconstitutional to do so. So, you know, even according to the Constitution, which as Terrence McKenna uh, uh, observed, isn't worth the hemp it's written on if it doesn't allow for, uh, you know, our freedom to uh, experiment with our own consciousness. Um, you know, if, I mean, if you think about it, for the United States to claim to be a free country um, and to control people's internal environment, uh, it's the most absurd, insane, I mean, it doesn't really get any crazier than that. And, um, you know, there, as it is, uh, uh, the, 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 it's typical with psychedelics, that there are these like, you know, layers and layers and layers of concrete revelation. Um, it's really interesting to me that the, the story uh, and the implications of every facet of psychedelics will just unfurl and un uh, expand like a fractal. Um, it's, it's a really interesting uh, aspect of, of the situation. Um, I don't want to get too mystical in this, uh, this live stream because I, I do plenty of that. But, um, yeah, and the sentences that people were given for possession of LSD, which it turns out is actually not only innocuous and non-addictive uh, and uh, it, it, extremely difficult, if not impossible, to overdose on, it actually has sort of like built-in safety mechanisms. It stops working if you take it too frequently. Uh, if you take over, I think it's only 2,500 micrograms, um, there's a, a ceiling where it just sort of washes through at that point and that you can't just keep getting higher and higher and higher. Uh, trust me, at the max dose, you are you better have the right people around you. Um, definitely something not to take lightly, but the point is that uh, 
Um, this has been absolutely established by uh, 10 cases where people actually did lines of snorted, you know, insufflated lines of pure crystal LSD thinking that it was MDMA or cocaine or whatever it was that they thought they had. Um, and they were all estimated to have taken 20,000 micrograms, which is like, you know, 20, 20 sheets, I guess, by the average dose today, uh, 100, and I think usually they're under 100. Uh, and all of those people were fine. They came down in the normal period of time. So all those stories people tell you about how they trip for three days, most of them are just attention seeking exaggerators, or they took something like STP that wasn't LSD. Uh, and they checked it up on them five years later and they were all fine, no flashbacks, nothing. Um, so the moral of the story basically, without getting too much into depth about it, is that not only did they exaggerate the risks of these compounds, um, but they're actually beneficial and remarkably safe considering how powerful they are and uh, the kind of changes that they can affect in the brain. Um, so, you know, putting 22 year old kids uh, in prison for multiple decades after cops had harassed this particular individual that I'm thinking of for three years uh, before he finally relented. I mean, the guy wasn't even an LSD dealer uh, and this was in the uh, 1980s and he was finally pardoned by Obama right before Obama left office with only a year left on his sentence. So, you know, and then if you consider the efficacy of all of these compounds of LSD and, and ayahuasca and, and mescaline and MDMA, all of them really, um, ketamine even, uh, their, the ability to um, get rid of alcoholism, to treat addiction, uh, in fact, it has come out quite a long time ago. Uh, no one used to believe me when I said this, um, but the 13th step in uh, AA was supposed to be LSD. Uh, in fact, the uh, founder of AA got sober when he took LSD. Um, so, you know, it is, so if you consider how many less drunk driving deaths there might have been, how many less murders, how many less just lives destroyed, the, the toll on the uh, medical, uh, uh, you know, on the, the public health care system, um, just with alcoholism alone and how much of that may have been averted if psychedelics hadn't been banned and if research had been allowed to continue, right? So um, this, this, is, this is bad, you know, it's really, really bad um, that, that, that this situation was allowed to, you know, persevere for as long as it did. Uh, it's still going on. I mean, there are still plenty of people in prison for LSD, it hasn't exactly been legalized, but we have hit a juncture, and we have hit a, 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 a sign. We have come upon a signpost uh, that it has a lot of good omens. Um, there are people that were major players, major figures in the drug war, that um, have admitted that they were wrong. Uh, to hear that for me, coming from an era where we had Nancy Reagan saying that suspected, not convicted, but suspected drug dealers should be shot on sight. Um, you know, and the kind of fear and paranoia that we had to live with as advocates of psychedelic medicine um, and just users of psychedelics. Uh, growing up in a place like Virginia where I lived, you know, the police did not care about your rights. They, you didn't have to be black. You could just have long hair as I always did and they would just come out of nowhere from all directions and search you. They would lie to arrest you. I mean, it was just absolutely um, horrific uh, to live in a place like Fairfax County, Virginia in that kind of police state, uh, even as far back as the 1990s. And their precedent uh, or their inroad to all of this harassment and um, abuse of your rights basically was always, you know, maybe you have a little bit of marijuana in your pocket. Maybe you, you know, have some psilocybin or some cocaine, uh, and you would go to prison for, um, oh, I, I once had a, a tub of magic mushrooms growing and a cop was in my apartment for some unrelated reason. And he was standing right next to the tub with the, um, you know, it's got like a pipe connected to a humidifier and if he had, if he looked right at it 
And if it had clicked in his head what it was, um, Virginia at the time probably still has this five-year mandatory minimum for growing psilocybin mushrooms. So that means that the judge would have been forced to uh, sentence me to a minimum of five years in prison. I think I was 20 years old uh, at the time. So, um, I, I mean, it's just, there, there are no words to describe the injustice of this situation. Uh, and you know, I'm sure you guys will go and watch the How to Change Your Mind documentary if you haven't already. But you know, there was one woman who, I don't wanna give you too many spoilers, but there is one woman who uh, came upon her mother's murder-suicide scene a few months after um, her older brother had overdosed on heroin, and then she was uh, lost her home in Hurricane Katrina and all this, and uh, you know, MDMA just got rid of her PTSD. Uh, the amygdala, uh, it, it basically just changes the way that it operates so that you can confront uh, fear in a way that is not possible unless it's sort of um, short-circuited. And so, you know, I mean, that's, that's another, uh, another one of those extraordinary travesties uh, that was n none of this was motivated by research. Okay, the, it's w one of the things that people oftentimes are not aware of is that the researchers in the 1960s that were commissioned by the government they did not say these drugs are terrible. You should never let anyone take them. Humphrey Osmond said, you know, you can we can cure probably every known psychological aberration with these compounds, often in a single dose, uh, which directly. Uh, uh, sort of reflects or it's a you know antecedent it but it reflects exactly recently a researcher at John Hopkins said um, that it is simply unprecedented in the history of psychiatry that a compound can um, cure so many psychological problems oftentimes in a single dose it's it's but the point of this is that it's not new this is not new information um, that's the one bone that I have to pick with a lot of the people that are promoting this documentary. And I think it's important that we remember that. These are not new revelations. And that's how a lot of people, including Michael Pollan, are spinning it. Like, now we have the research. No, we've had the research since the 1960s, since the 1950s, since MK Ultra. okay? They were, you know, there was an uprising amongst the youth and these compounds would allow people to deprogram and reprogram their own consciousness, um, to take charge to take control of their own conscious evolution and undo all of their religious programming, all of the, you know, all of the propaganda that they spend billions and billions of dollars on suddenly ineffectualized. Um, so really po posed quite a threat to the status quo. And of course, in my opinion, that's the real reason that this happened. The researchers said, you know, this basically will negate an entire wing of big pharma, these compounds. And, um, you know, one alarming thing that I, uh, another alarming thing, I guess, that I saw in this video is that Michael Pollan uh, and a lot of other people are so, speaking of indoctrination, still indoctrinated to the extent that they seem to think that the fact that the pharmaceutical companies won't be able to find a way to uh, make money off of something like psilocybin that you maybe only have to give someone once is a legitimate reason to have an issue with legalizing it. That just, it just, it's just extraordinary to me. Um, and it's something that we all need to be aware of and prepared to face, especially with older people like Michael Pollan. Um, they have been so long indoctrinated into this way of thinking um, that it's very, very difficult. Even once their neuroplasticity has been kind of restored and uh, neurogenesis has been um, catalyzed, you know, they're still struggling a little bit with processing um, uh, how to think about all of this stuff. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the main, the main, okay, so there was one other really significant uh, scene that I want to talk about a little bit with you guys. And there was this cop um, that they gave MDMA to uh, as part of the clinical studies. And um, 
you know, coming from the super intense police state drug war, Virginia Commonwealth background that I did, uh, it's an incredible thing for me to see a cop take a high dose of MDMA and the things that he was saying about how, you know, we need every police officer to take this stuff. I think he said something to that effect. He definitely said all of the damage that we have done to all these people in all these communities, we have to go out there and start to reverse it. You know, it sucks, but somebody's got to do it. We have to turn policing into a guardianship instead of, which is what it's supposed to be, instead of the kind of, um, uh, you know, fascist, uh, uh, you know, iron fist uh, that it's become in the United States. And so when I realized that there are a lot of cops that are having these experiences that, I mean, can you imagine a United States where there is a police force that understands that psychedelics are actually good for people? Because, you know, this isn't just about psychedelics. There is an entourage effect with the change in thinking that is going to occur when people, uh, you know, they don't even have to consume the compounds, but, you know, even for example, just the knowledge that the government had put people in prison and denied access to millions and millions of people who may have been cured and allowed to live good lives. And then they're, you know, if we're talking about something like depression, uh, you know, people like me who lost their mother to suicide or um, uh, alcoholic fathers that beat the shit out of their entire families, or, you know, maybe they might not have crossed the line and actually molested their daughter if they weren't drunk. You know, there's so many um, sort of adjunct uh, aberrative behaviors that could have been uh, avoided if we had these compounds um, available to people. So, you know, that's that's really the main um, the main thing that I think we all really need to take to heart is exactly how much damage, not just by the drug war, but particularly by the prohibition of psychedelics. Uh, we need to never forget how much they lied. Um, you know, there was a, 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 a special, like an after school special on MTV about how MDMA put gigantic holes in your brain. And they literally had real doctors standing around and lying in full consciousness that they were lying. Um, so, you know, I mean, this is another point for the conspiracy theorists because when, you know, people scoff at the idea that the government can just constrain these people to do all these terrible things and to lie to the public, uh, you know, we have it on video. Um, because the reality is that they showed, you know, Dr. Now that video and he said if that girl had had holes like that in her brain, she would have been so dead immediately. You know, there's no possibility that this group of doctors that were standing around talking about how MDMA put holes in your brains didn't know they were lying through their teeth. There's no possibility of that. So, um, you know, that's, that's just, it's a really good example of how far they have actually gone to demonize what was actually one of the most beneficial compounds ever discovered by uh, mankind. Also, R.I.P. Ann Shulgin, Sasha Shulgin and Ann Shulgin uh, did a tremendous amount of work to further uh, psychedelic medicine. Uh, if you don't know who they are, Peichel and Teichel are their books, uh, Phenethylamines I've Known and Loved and Tryptamines I've Known and Loved. And they basically spent their entire lives uh, administering all these compounds that uh, Sasha would make in his laboratory and generally usually having sex uh, to see what would happen. Um, and, and so that, that was basically their, um, their life, their life work. And, uh, you know, but they really did make a tremendous uh, contribution. Um, and so, uh, you know, she was 91 years old and lived an amazing life, um, but still sad to see her go. She's in the documentary, of course. Um, by the way, you guys, do me a favor, hit the like button, share, subscribe, support us on Patreon if you would like access to our secret streams and you wanna support voices like mine uh, that um, will just say anything they can until they finally delete my channel. Um, you can also support us uh, one time on PayPal or, um, well, there are different options in the description and in the chat and also we are still having retreats uh, here in Ecuador until October. 
Um, so you can find an email address to get in touch with me about that in the comments. Um, yeah, so the cop thing, that was completely crazy. Um, but you know, so those were the two really inspiring things. Uh, what's the difference between MDMA and Molly? Nothing. Molly is um, a, it's short for molecule. Um, and it is supposed to imply that the MDMA is completely and totally pure, which in my experience is almost never true. Uh, MDMA should be a hexagonal um, sort of orange or rust colored um, crystal. Uh, it shouldn't really be pure white. It shouldn't really be clear. Um, and, uh, oh, I, I forgot to mention something about the, the woman with the holes in her brain. Um, they had another study also that they uh, did in conjunction um, or as an adjunct to this propaganda against MDMA. And um, they, it turns out they used meth on the mice instead of MDMA. Um, so this has all been exposed and, you know, the scientific community, of course, they're more evolved and open-minded these days. And uh, this is really, you know, embarrassing for the, um, the political people that were in charge at the time. And it really is, an, it's exposing the links that the government will go to to manipulate public perception um, towards its own ends. Um, and I, you know, I really hope that some of the people that have somehow lost their minds and have this amnesia, um, you know, because back in the early 2000s, it seems like we were pretty much all on the same page uh, with the extent to which the government would create lies and propaganda. And uh, it seems like a lot of people have forgotten. Um, so hopefully this, this, this is just such a great example of the psychedelic medicine situation because they lied so directly and so consciously for so long um, <clears throat> and the social harm that is directly a product of those lies is immeasurable. <clears throat> the prison system, the healing that could have happened that has been um, circumvented, uh, I can't forgive them. I mean, it, 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 it had a lot to do with, with destroying a lot of my life. I mean, you know, I didn't really fully believe myself, even though I, I knew what these compounds were capable of, um, you know, right away. I think most people probably do uh, when they come into contact with them. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think that even though I was a, a, a very free thinker, uh, I still, you know, was affected by the indoctrination. I had a lot of doubts. Um, and I was a very, very wounded person. So I really, really needed these compounds a lot more than I availed themself, myself of them until the last uh, few years I've started again, or 10 years now, I guess it's been. Um, but yeah, it's a terrible, terrible tragedy. The people that are in jail, none of them should be there. Um, okay, but the other thing that I was getting at here is just seeing this cop uh, on MDMA and the things that he was saying and he was also talking about how there are programs now where they're really trying to change how police think about being police uh, in the United States. And one of the effects that this had on me is that I really have, have decided that once this season is over, um, I'd been really on the fence, but I really do want to get back to the United States and get more directly involved in making music and um, just sort of being an advocate um, for this for this medicine. Uh, I cannot do, um, I can't have quite as much of an impact from the jungle in Ecuador, I, I don't think, as I could if I was actually physically there. And uh, so it was just really inspiring. Also, Rick Doblin, um, the fact that he has stuck with this impossible battle. I mean, he said that he didn't expect to see um, the changes that he's seeing today with, uh, you know, psilocybin being legalized and drug war, um, stalwarts saying, admitting that they were wrong. You know, he, I didn't expect to ever see that. He didn't expect to ever see it, but yet he persevered with his mission. He did not give up. And I almost give up all the time. You know, I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I, it's, 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 um, it can seem really hopeless when you look out into the world and you realize how brainwashed and indoctrinated 
and lost. So many of the people are around the world. And then we have all these completely insane governments that are, you know, we have Putin blatantly threatening to nuke different, you know, to what was it, a nuclear tidal wave, nuclear tidal wave for Britain, you know what I mean? We, we, we have to kind of live with all of this stuff and still somehow have hope. And it, it occurred to me that Rick Doblin has been living through this stuff um, and still maintaining his hope. And he fought and fought and fought and fought relentlessly and tirelessly and was never dissuaded. And now, unexpectedly, almost miraculously, he's seeing the fruits of his labors in this lifetime, which he did not ever expect. So it just really made me feel like I need to tap back into that... Um, Yeah, I absolutely, um, actually, Misty, Misty, I would be willing to come there first, um, because my father, uh, lives in, um, in Virginia, uh, and, uh, he hasn't seen, he hasn't met my son yet, um, so... Yeah, and, you know, speaking of, uh, people being in recovery, Misty, this, um... Flow state integration and the dopamine uh, baseline, ele the elevated dopamine baseline uh, program that I'm coming up with is going to be amazing for people that use psychedelic medicine to uh, deal with addiction. Because one of the problems is that, you know, even after the peak experience of something like ayahuasca, you can still fall down into these lower realms and lower levels of consciousness and boredom. Um, and really the key to uh, avoiding that is to maintain a steady supply of dopamine. Dopamine has had a bad rap over the years as like the cause of addiction, which is actually trauma, and, or that it's like a, a reward system that you can just, and you can, you can't abuse it with social media and whatever, but um, there are ways to structure your diet and build certain activities where you can just elevate the baseline. And then what you're gonna find is that your motivation is going to be uh, increased significantly and your capability to do pretty much anything is going to be enhanced because pattern recognition is um, is enhanced by dopamine. Uh, this is why your intuition gets so strong. You know, you can get kind of mystical about it too. People, including myself, talk about how when you get into flow state, you have this voice that will direct you and its directives are absolutely correct. And for me, when that voice comes, even in my daily life, and I don't do whatever it says, it's always bad. And even when it's like ridiculous, uh, it always turns out to be true. So it does seem that, you know, we have this like extremely powerful uh, capacity for precognition and intuition, uh, regardless of what the explanation for it might be, uh, that is very strongly enhanced with, with dopamine. Um, so the motivation and the increased intuitive capacity uh, and in order to get there, you have to do a bunch of healthy things. You need to eat a bunch of healthy food and you need to exercise and you need to meditate. And then you have to do other things that are not necessarily going to be healthy because they involve risk. Um, so, you know, if, if it goes badly, then, you know, I mean, life's a gamble. Um, but that is one of the uh, triggers for flow state, which is the other part of this program. Um, so basically the idea is that you are going to uh, create space for flow triggers, flow state triggers all over the place in your life. Uh, a mystical practice, mindfulness, um, is also uh, a, a prerequisite for entering into flow state concentration, right? Creativity, um, also autonomy. Um, and uh, an interesting aspect of this that I realized while I've been doing the research and building the protocol is that our society is basically structured to inhibit uh, flow state, which I think actually has a lot of different names. Um, it's the transcendental consciousness, uh, spiritual experience, um, you know, just mastery on the level of someone like Bruce Lee or, you know, Al, uh, who was that, uh, Luke, um, the really great, um, uh, flamenco guy, uh, Paco de Lucia, you know, that type of thing where these people seem to be able to enter into this state at will. Uh, I don't think it's really that elusive. So the idea is that rather than having a peak experience like ayahuasca, after the um, psychedelic therapy is over, we are maintaining, um, we're staying at the peak of the mountain, um, but without having to consume ayahuasca every single day uh, by elevating our baseline dopamine and uh, creating a sort of permanent flow state in our daily life. 
Um, so, yeah, we can make arrangements uh, and figure it out because um, I'm definitely ready to um, head up there and um, see my dad and start a band again and uh, sort of do the whole North American California psychedelic, you know, musician thing again. I don't know how, how I ever walked away from that in the first place. Um, the drummer, the last drummer that I played with, Jay Lane, has just taken the throne from Bill Kreutzmann as one of the drummers in Dead & Company. Uh, that's a crazy thing to see, man, because those guys were like my biggest heroes. And, and Jay had played with them um, prior to um, this with uh, Further. And he was the original drummer in Primus as well, uh, which was my rhythm section's favorite band. So it was really an honor to have him play with us for a while. Um, and uh, yeah, that was a crazy thing to see him um, get that job. <laughs> Uh, so, so yeah, um, I, you know, that also really inspired me to want to get home and get back to work with music. Um, so Luminostic is coming to the United States, you guys. Anybody that wants to help me organize, um, you know, ayahuasca ceremonies up there when I arrive, that'd be very helpful, uh, because I'll probably be doing it, um, by the hair of my teeth, uh, financially, uh, unless things turn around down here uh the protests that we just had in ecuador really um really were just terrible timing for us so if you guys have been wanting to come and see the amazon rainforest and experience different plant medicines and learn how to do it yourself and maybe learn about hermetic ritual magic um this would be the time uh so i'm very sick and tired and i don't want to start rambling like a fool um i think i've made my point you know i mean we have to uh, not let this sort of thing happen and we need to uh, you know take note of how um, the extent to which people have been forced to carry around cognitive dissonance and really we need to stop being so polite because the level of cowardice uh, that is required of your average person that knows what psychedelics do to not riot when a single person is in jail for LSD is pathetic it's absolutely pathetic um, you know, and I guess I'm guilty of too much complacency, but, uh, you know, we really need to stop being polite and you, we can't accept things that are absolutely crimes against humanity. Like that's not okay. You know, and it's not just psychedelics. People need to stop being such cowards. It's literally allowing a fascist takeover. I mean, even MSNBC is talking about how the United States is becoming fascist at this point. You know, the people the you know like the the liberals that really trust the government and the right wingers that think they don't trust the government but are totally just like propaganda mouthpieces for the elite and big oil and stuff you just cowards stop it you know snap out of it we need to we need to stand up and fight we need to speak the truth uh we need to we need to be motivated by a sense of purpose uh you know what i mean we have to like be willing to live uh, in, in the light of righteousness, uh, at, at whatever cost, because, um, you know, middle-class people, I think, think they're on an island and they're buffered from all of the things that are affecting everyone else. And, you know, they sort of act like they're, they, they think they're, they're morally, um, you know, they're good people because they don't actively do anything that is like terrible. Um, but I, I think under the current circumstances, under the circumstances we've been living in uh, for hundreds of years, really, I mean, I can't think of a time, maybe ancient Greece, um, you know, it's, we just, we can't accept these things anymore. We cannot continue to just live with these sort of atrocities just because they're not affecting us. Because now they're affecting everyone. Uh, the, the governments are running amok, you're losing all your rights. Um, you know, people are being divided uh, more than ever, even though uh, right and left actually have more common ground than they have ever had before in my entire lifetime. They hate each other more than ever. And that is being deliberately engineered. Uh, you know what I mean? This is not conspiracy theory. This is like so blatantly obvious that it's painful. It's really painful, like really painful to watch it. And I mean, it's almost broken me over the last couple of years. I had so much enthusiasm and so much energy and determination to make changes in the world. And when I started to realize the extent to which people are just like non-player character 
uh, you know, zombie indoctrinated, um, self-serving, like it really just, it, it really, really burst my bubble for the last couple of years. I mean, I've still been here trying to do what I do, you know, um, but not with nearly the zeal and enthusiasm and the, the you know, confidence um, that I had a few years ago. So, you know, I wanna thank Rick Doblin and Timothy Leary and Terrence McKenna, Jerry Garcia, uh, <laughs> you know, all of these people. Um, Rick Doblin, did I say that already? Especially Rick Doblin right now, um, because, you know, fighting in the trenches like that for 50 years, putting himself at risk too, um, they will frame you and throw you in prison if they don't like you. I don't, you know, I don't care what anyone says, the United States, is that sketchy um you know i mean i'm i i share a, i have a lot of liberal values I, i'm definitely not a conservative but i have been horrified at the extent to which liberals have come to trust the government i think that's what barack obama was about they just they wanted to gain the trust of the left and the liberals of the government because they didn't have it you know and they were the biggest threat the conservatives generally will just like whatever their leaders tell them to do they're just really easy to just puppet with propaganda so it was much more important to sort of get control of the left to silence the intelligent and to dazzle the idiots and the dazzling of the idiots was actually just giving them a bunch of wedge issues um, to incite the right and cause a bunch of fighting with I mean it's it's so just dumb to watch all of this go down it really is I, I, um, but you know, I'm not focusing on that now. I'm thinking about the fact that we have police officers out there taking MDMA and you know, he, he said, uh, PTSD can't be all that this is good for. At one point I was like, wow, man, it's just so incredible to see cops that are, you know, understand these things. I mean, and they need it. They need it. Cops need uh, PTSD therapy. They need MDMA. They need LSD. Uh, they shouldn't be allowed to be cops if they haven't had mushrooms or ayahuasca or something. I mean, no one should be really allowed to exist if they haven't taken these things. And I don't mean that they should be, like, genocided or something. I just mean that the, uh, the lack of a psychedelic initiatory right uh, for people in their adolescence, I think, is a big part of the reason why... Um, our culture has gone down the drain, you know. Um, it's pretty much standard fare to have some sort of major consciousness altering um, ritual at coming of age, uh, which in, you know, tribal societies is much younger um, than, than in our culture. Uh, but you know what I mean. Um, bad move to take that out of the equation. Uh, we need to put it back. We need to put it back. And cops need to trip and they know it they're starting to realize it so um you know it's been a really scary um difficult uh, few years but you know at the current juncture i actually have a lot more hope than i have in quite some time um because you know getting the police on our side for example is a huge 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 step just for someone like me to be able to go back to the united states and maybe not be afraid of harassment and to be able to move freely and live without paranoia, um, just in regards to possessing psychedelics all the time, is so huge, so huge. I mean, when I think about the stress and fear that I had to live with just to live my life the way that I wanted to for most of my life, it's no wonder that I ended up with stomach problems, you know? Um, it, and, and the thing is, I was right. I did need those compounds. They were uh, medicine. Um, and they do help you with creativity. Uh, they do expand your consciousness. They even give you access to parts of the brain that you never can use. Like you have to try to wrap your head around this. There is electrical activity in parts of the brain when you take LSD or psilocybin where there's never any otherwise. So not even master meditators, monks, have electrical activity in those areas. Like just as Terrence McKenna said, you know, he, he said he, he never believed that, um, that, you know, you could get further without these compounds than with them. And he said, look at the literature. And I know, I, I noticed that right away that I have had way more mind blowing conversations with just some random acid head on a street corner in California than I've ever seen in like a Buddhist scripture or heard come out of a monk's mouth. I, I saw another monk say, um, that he spent 10 years in a monastery and he got more out of four hours of ayahuasca. You know, and I'm not trying to put these traditions down because we need the meditation, 
uh, but for a different purpose. We, we need that to uh, give ourselves discipline and willpower and to remain calm. Um, but as far as like accelerating uh, the expansion of our consciousness and, and resolving trauma and creating superhuman intelligence even, um, they, they, they just got nothing on it. And um, I think there is part of me that's kind of irritated with having to listen to that crap my whole life from people. Shouldn't you be able to do it without drugs? They're not drugs, you know, in my opinion, they're not drugs. And I feel like it's like saying, shouldn't you be able to go to the moon without a spaceship? Like, why don't you just walk to the moon, you know? Um, so anyways, uh, <laughs> but it's true, you know? I mean, we need to use all these things together, but um, people that, that don't know anything about the things that they're speaking about always just speak about them anyways. Um, and hopefully, you know, this is something I think psychedelics can help to address. Um, Maybe some of those people will know, and then they can start speaking without doing damage. Uh, you know, it's funny. We say that people can believe whatever they want, um, so long as they're not hurting anyone. But it turns out that if you believe stupid, insane, or even false things, and then you speak, you're going to do damage. So it's actually, like, not good um, for people to just believe whatever they want. Uh, you know, they should be able to think however they want, um, but... I think we have a lot of revising to do in what we think are uh, acceptable or even commendable um, positions on a lot of stuff. Uh, I, I, I recently saw a um, intellectual uh, from some Ivy League school talking about how um, <clears throat> most of our cultural norms are wrong and they're rooted in delusion. And it was so refreshing to hear somebody from his position in society say that. Uh, and again, I would bet money that it's because he took psychedelics that he had this insight um, that, you know, having a cultural norm doesn't mean it's correct. And the thing that is so difficult for people is that uh, until your mind is chemically altered uh, and the default mode network is sort of scattered, um, you can just believe things that are totally just not true and actually harmful you can believe they're good like you you probably do have at least one of those things um and so what happens with psychedelics is that the light is shined on those things where uh we don't normally look because we don't have a choice all of a sudden the boundaries are dissolved and um reality is just sort of laid plain isn't it amazing too that it, it's becoming increasingly obvious that uh, the only people that seem to be able to actually see reality as it is are people that have taken psychedelics. Everyone else is living in a complete cloud of illusion. You know, it seems so backwards, even when I hear it, but it's absolutely the truth. It's very uncommon in our culture. And maybe it wouldn't be true if we didn't have such a toxic, you know, culture and we didn't have all the indoctrination uh, you know, we didn't have all this programming, um, but we do. And so these compounds are absolutely necessary. And, um, so happy tripping, uh, be safe, be careful, and, you know, speak your mind, speak the truth. Um, don't be fearful. Don't be a coward. Don't trust the government. Uh, you know, Go watch uh, How to Change Your Mind with Michael Poland. Join me on the live stream tomorrow. Hit the like button, share, subscribe, support us on Patreon where you can access our secret streams and you'll get a discount on my course when it's released. And you can send me an email and you can pre-order um, the course or you can even invest. I need like one person because it would be way better for me to outsource a lot of this stuff to people that'll do a better job and help me get it out faster. Um, but uh, special prices for people that uh, pre-order the course. Um, and you can support us through PayPal, Zelle, and cryptocurrency. Options in the description. We're demonetized. We get nothing for this. I do it almost every day. So, um, And we were shut down last month. Uh, so we definitely appreciate your support a lot at the moment. Um, so, uh, anyways, tomorrow night I'll be back um, to talk about the new um, Flow State Lifestyle uh, program that I've conceived. I'm super excited about it because, you know, people have asked me for a long time when I would write a book or, or create a course or whatever. And I just felt like until I have something 
that is actually unique and makes a legitimate contribution, I just can't do it, you know? I mean, I'm not gonna just repackage a bunch of information that's already available in a million different places and, you know, I mean, what exactly is that? But now I know exactly what I need to do. It's a, a really a glorious thing to have, have had this revelation in the last week or so because um, I think it'll probably end up curing our financial woes and it'll also help a lot of people tremendously. Uh, it really, I think I've created the best support uh, system for people that are coming out of, of psychedelic medicine um, experiences and really for anyone uh, just to uh, live a more creative and fulfilling life. So we'll see you again tomorrow. Thank you so much for spending this time with me.